Hey everyone, uh, welcome back to Cybersecurity TV. Uh, this week we're going to talk about the interesting attack, which is SGP request smuggling. Now, this attack is uh, has been very confused uh, among the security professionals. So I, I thought, like you know, maybe let's just take a deep dive into what this request smuggling attack is, and I'll, I'll show you some examples and what are the prevention techniques. So the simple term, like if we if we break down the sentence HTTP request plus smuggling. Now what the smuggling is, uh, as we all know, uh, the gangster used to do is like smuggle uh, some bad things uh, uh, with the good container, right? So that's that's what we call it smuggling. Uh, if you try, if you are if you are sending some vegetables and in between the vegetables you you want to send something bad, you you call it smuggling. So that is what the 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 uh, concept behind this attack is, and that is what uh, the attacker usually uses uh, to smuggle some bad code or bad request body uh, with the valid request body. Now, uh, the HTTP request smuggling uh, uh, exploits uh, the fact that there's some specially crafted HTTP messages can be parsed and interpreted in different ways depending on the agent that receives them. So for any request, you have front end and the back end. Now if the software or the version of the software is different at the front and the back end, they might interpret the same message different way. And that's the uh, like you know weakness that attacker is exploiting. Now uh, it requires uh, like you know uh, this attack requires some level of uh, knowledge, uh, like some level of uh, like you know different agents, how they work, and also uh, knowledge on where the application is hosted, how the application is hosted. If you have that knowledge, it's easier uh, to exploit. If it, if you don't, then it becomes a bit time consuming. So that's why this is generally included in the in the gray box testing, uh, like you know scenario or engagement. Now here's the thing, like irrespective of you know the technology or not, it's always possible. Like when you come across with such a finding, you always report to your client. Like even if you feel like okay, that there, there might be possibility of smuggling attack, then you report to the client. And that is why the small things matter. So even when you're testing, you don't like you know you find something 500 error message or verbose error messages now itself is not a vulnerability but it gives you some information which you can use to attack to uh, like you know uh, make a bigger attack like a request smuggling so when you chain together so that is why that small small uh, vulnerabilities low risk finding does add up uh, when you are exploiting something big so for example here is our, our request right so here is the uh, front end server and here is the request uh, uh, there is a content length header transfer encoding. We'll see this in the uh, next few slides, what the difference is. But let's say here is the uh, request which has gone to the front end server. And when it comes to the back end server, uh, like, you know, it, it they just interpret this because uh, because of these headers, content length and the transfer encoding. Based on that, like how you interpret the request might sit seem different at the front end and the back end. And we will see an example uh, why, why is this the case. Right? So here we can see in the back end, uh, it, it dropped or, or like, you know, break it down into multiple requests. This, so these are, this actually counters the second request, while this is one entire request in the front end. So here is the, like, you know, uh, front end where the various users are sending the requests, and then in the back end, it, the request gets split again and, and served back to the user based on the uh, based on the algorithm. Now, what the attacker will do is, uh, with the valid request or legitimate request, they'll put in the smuggled request, which will go to the web back end and which, like you know, be interpreted by the back end as a new request, and they will send some internal information uh, back to the attacker. So that's what, like you know, we saw like what's the smuggling uh, in the real world, and that is the same concept we are doing here in the HTTP uh, or the internet as well. So what are the possible attacks you can do? One can do like a web cache poisoning. Uh, you can do deception attacks. You can do session hijacking. You can do cross-site scripting, and you can do uh, WAF. So uh, bypass the WAF. So we cannot, like you know, learn all of this in one session. But these are the possible attacks that you can do with the smuggling attack. But your task when you're doing the pen test, your your task is to f 
find such vulnerability and not to exploit it, right? But of course, this is a huge because uh, the impact is huge if one can exploit this vulnerability. So let's talk about the content length and transfer encoding header. So uh, content length, uh, as we all know, it determines how long or what are the how many characters are there in the request body. So for example, here 11 denotes, uh, in, that's include the new line characters and, and like you know each of these characters. So when it goes to the front end or the back end, it will see these are the content length and that is how they will know this request has ended and then it's a next request. So anything which come after this 11th character will be counted as a new request by the front end and back end. So that is the significance of the uh, content length. Transfer encoding is called as a chunked. So here, like one of the values is chunked encoding. So here, if you specify transfer encoding and not the content length, then uh, server will interpret whenever it receives the zero byte message. That's when it terminates the request and then it interprets any characters after that as a new request. So this B, uh, like, you know, Q is equal to smuggling and, and zero uh, will be considered as a one request, but anything after this will be part of a new request because here it denotes that there are zero characters, uh, like, left over. This is the final uh, byte in the request, and that's where the request will be terminated. Right, so here we count the total number of characters. Here it's a chunk encoding. So here, if, let's say if we say number eight, so it will say next eight characters will be part of this request, and then it will start a new request. So there is one, uh, there are various ways to exploit this, and the first way to do it is via double content length. So what the attacker would do is they'll specify two content length. So here I have done like one with the 45 value and one with the zero. Now how it works is, uh, if you count this, these are actually 45 characters, right? So when it goes to the front end, it will say, it will interpret, let's say, the first content length. It will say, okay, all of this is one request, right? So this is not a new request, it's a one request. It's a request body of this request. So it will then go to the back end. Now when it goes to the back end, assume back end is considering content length at zero rather than 45, because there is a mismatch between the front end and the back end, so back end interprets the request differently. So what it interprets is there is no request body, and it will consider this as a new request, and it will actually send two responses rather than just one response. Now imagine if you have, like, you know, uh, in, uh, added some malicious page or some malicious payload, it will also send you response for that second request, which which is not a request itself, it's a part of the one request body. But that's how the mismatch between the front end server and the back end server could initiate the smuggling attack. Let's see another example. So the second one is content length and uh, tra uh, transfer encoding. So for example, in the request, you have both content length and transfer encoding. What, like, you know, uh, how would server interpret? So as per uh, the standard, when both of these are present, like content length and transfer encoding, transfer encoding overrides the content length. So server has to consider uh, or has to prioritize the transfer encoding. But let's say that's not the case. Like again, because we have some older version or we have some uh, deficiency in our server and somehow it prioritized the content length. So here, uh, it's a 62, that means, of course, all of this is passed as a request body. But in the back end, if it counts as chunked, so it will say, okay, there are 16 characters, so it will uh, like you know, consider this as a one request, and then terminate the request here with the byte zero, and then this will be initiated as the next request, right? So. Uh, this is quite possible, and, and this is the most common type of attack that I've seen when, uh, like, you know, you provide both content length as well as transfer encoding. Now, this is sometimes very difficult to, uh, like, you know, uh, perform such attack because transfer encoding uh, can be, like, you know, blacklist or disallowed by the WAF. 
uh, when you have the content length it will count as an ambiguous request and but there is there are ways you can bypass so if you want to bypass you can use uh, this particular payloads so rather than just transferring coding chunk you can do x you can do space and then there's there are I guess few more on the internet if you search for, but these are the main ones that I, I, I found, so I just put it here. So you can use this uh, to bypass uh, if you're not able to pass content length as well as transfer encoding. So this is another way to uh, uh, verify whether the uh, HTTP request smuggling is possible on the application or not. The last method uh, we're going to talk about is transfer encoding and content length, right, which is reverse of content length and transfer encoding. So here, we're assuming front end is considering or giving the priority to the transfer encoding, and what it's going to do is it's going to see the character 8, and it's going to take the smuggled uh, word as, as a request body and terminate the request at the zero character, while the back end will take the content length, so there are two uh, line spaces so it will count as a one character each and the third character will be eight so that's why we have the three content length and then it will consider this as a new request so that's another possible way you can try and exploit uh, this vulnerability now it is possible that like you know um, some scanners like burp would automatically check this for you but it's not always I guess you can rely on this one. Uh, you should also probably take take a request and and try to perform some of these attacks. Try to like you know uh, this is not very hard to verify. You just put this uh, three different scenarios and see how the application reacts, right? So based on that, you can verify whether this is vulnerable to uh, such request smuggling or not. Uh, let's talk about the prevention. Uh, so the prevention is simple. Of course, you want to prioritize transfer encoding over content line, not just for the front end proxy, but for the front end and the back end, right? So if you have the consistent uh, mechanism uh, which you want to prioritize, I think it's easier uh, and, and there won't be any ambiguous request for front end versus back end. Next, uh, disallow request with both uh, because there is no actually such requirement like you don't want both content length and transfer encoding or and you also don't want two content length headers right so if you get this request uh, perform some validation and then block the request or reject the request now you can also uh, disallow the malformed uh, transfer encoding headers some of the failures that we saw uh, uh, it's simple, right? Like you, you put the list, and if you have some automation, you can, of course, use that. If not, then you can put this, uh, like, you know, a blacklist characters, and if it matches, and then you just reject the request. And finally, uh, you can also use, like, a WAF to detect and block the ambiguous request. And make sure you are always using uh, the same web server software for the front end and the back end server. So they agree about the boundaries between the request. So these are some recommendations that you can give it to your uh, team, your developers or uh, DevOps or, or clients on how to protect or prevent uh, against the HTTP request smuggling attacks. Uh, this was uh, like you know very interesting vulnerability and not very famous. So I thought like let me cover it because I do see this happening quite a quite a some time uh, in the recent days. So this is not something like you know very old vulnerability. So make sure you do verify this whenever you are doing the security assessment. Let me know uh, if anything that I missed in this uh, attack or like you know I would love to know. I would glad to uh, like you know gain some knowledge as well. Also, uh, let me know what are the topics that I should be covering. Uh, I think that that's about it. Let me know if you have any questions, comments, and thumbs up to uh, this video if you like it, and subscribe to my channel for more videos. All right, that's it for this week. I'll see you all next week. Bye.